This lecture will include principles for survey and design of a cast. In 1918, Dr. A.J. Fortunati introduced the dental surveyor at a dental clinic in Boston. It was a very simple instrument that changed the way we design partial dentures. Dr. Fortunati was not so fortunate to get his product on the market, but in 1923, J.M. Ney Corporation made the first commercially available surveyor. A dental surveyor is an instrument used to determine the relative parallelism of two or more surfaces of the teeth or other parts of the cast of the dental arch. It helps determine undercuts on the teeth, it marks the height of contour of the teeth, and helps us determine the path of insertion for the removable prosthesis. The primary purpose of the surveyor is to plan the tooth and tissue modifications necessary to fabricate a successful removable partial denture. It is by this modification of the teeth that it allows us to position the component parts of the partial in their ideal location, which brings about a good prognosis for our final partial denture. Currently, there are a limited number of surveyors on the market. Though these surveyors vary in design, most of them have, one, a level platform that is parallel to the bench top on which the cast holder is moved, two, a vertical column that supports the superstructure, three, a horizontal arm that extends to a right angle from the vertical column, four, a surveying arm that extends vertically from the horizontal arm. The surveying vertical arm can move in an up and down direction and contains a mandrel at the lower end. The mandrel holds various specialized tools that are used in the surveying process. Five, surveying tools that may be placed in the mandrel. Six, a surveying table which is designed to hold the cast to be surveyed. And seven, the base of the cast holder which is the bottom that rests on the platform. Let's look at some of the surveyor tools. A is an analyzing rod and is used to determine the relative parallelism of surfaces on the dental cast. B is a .01 undercut gauge, which measures the position desired on a tooth for a cast circumferential or a bar clasp to engage. It shows the position of the .01 undercut on the tooth. C is the .02 undercut gauge, which measures the position desired for a tooth that's going to have a wrought wire clasp placed on it. It shows the .02 undercut on the tooth. D is the .03 undercut gauge, which is not currently used very much. It was used more when uh, frames were made with gold. E is the lead or carbon marker that is used to mark the height of contour on the tooth. F is the lead sheath that is placed against the lead to provide some strength to prevent the lead from breaking under lateral pressure when the surveying is done on the cast. The lead sheath and the carbon marker are inserted into the mandrel. G is a wax knife. Actually, G and H are both wax knives or trimmers that are used during blockout procedures in the construction of surveyed crowns, or making the a record basis for complete dentures. The dental surveyor can be used for surveying the diagnostic cast, contouring wax patterns, surveying ceramic veneer crowns, placing intracoronal retainers, placing internal rest, machining cast restorations, and surveying the master cast. Partially edentulous arches consist of teeth and edentulous spaces with tissue. The dental arches also present with complicating factors such as soft tissue undercuts and bony prominences like tori and exostoses. When properly designed, the RPD may be placed with ease in only one direction. We need to look at the teeth, the edentulous spaces, the bony prominences in the dental arches and the best way to do this is with the dental surveyor. 
we are looking for the path of placement, which is the direction in which a restoration moves from the point of initial contact of the rigid parts with the supporting teeth to the terminal position with the rest seated and the denture base in contact with the tissues. We can determine this path of placement with the use of the dental surveyor. According to the glossary of prosthodontic terms, the path of placement is the specific direction in which a prosthesis is placed on the abutment tooth or a dental implant. According to our major text, the path of placement is the direction in which the restoration moves from the point of initial contact of its rigid parts with the supporting teeth to its terminal resting position with rest and the denture base completely seated. Another objective of surveying a diagnostic cast is to identify proximal tooth surfaces that are in need to be made parallel so that they act as guiding planes during placement and removal of the RPD. Guiding planes can be prepared parallel to one another and parallel to the path of insertion. A positive path of placement and removal is enhanced by the contact of rigid components of the dental framework with parallel tooth surfaces which act as guiding planes. See the brief illustration of the framework seating into this area of the guiding planes. That framework can only go one way into that area. Guiding planes control the path of placement and removal. They provide additional retention by limiting dislodgement and without guiding planes, some cases there would be practically non-existent retention on the prosthesis. Another objective of surveying a diagnostic cast is to locate and measure areas of the teeth that may be used for retention. We do that by identifying certain undercuts. With the surveyor, we can determine whether any bony areas of undercut called interferences will need to be eliminated surgically or minimized by selecting a different path of insertion. We are interested in aesthetics and we need to determine the most suitable path of placement that will permit locating direct retainers and artificial teeth to best create an aesthetic and functional result. Surveying a cast allows us to make a charting of the mouth so that we know where we need to make mouth preparations, such as preparing guide planes, reducing excessive contours, removing interferences, and in the end, creating a more accurate contour for placement of direct retainers and reciprocal components in their ideal location. By using the side of the lead in the surveyor, we can delineate the height of contour on an abutment tooth and locate undesirable tooth undercuts that need to be avoided, eliminated, or blocked out during fabrication. When we're finished surveying the cast, we want to mark the cast position in relation to the selected path of placement that we have. We do this by using either the end of the lead or the O3 undercut cut gauge, and we position the vertical arm in one spot where we can touch the cast in three widely spaced positions. This is called tripoding the cast. It allows us to replace the cast onto the surveyor and position it in exactly the same position as before we sent it to the laboratory. The surveyor wax trimming blade is used to create wax patterns for cast crowns. We can place parallel guiding planes on all proximal surfaces at the chosen path of insertion. Also, all other tooth contours in contact with rigid components can be made parallel. The surfaces with reciprocal components should be contoured to permit the component part to be no higher than in the middle third of the tooth. And the contours for retentive arms should be created so that the retention is in the cervical one-third and have a 0.01 or 0.02 undercut for the appropriate clasp arm. The ceramic veneer crown cannot be fabricated to a form necessary for perfect placement of the retentive component. 
it has to be shaped with stones after the crown's created. So a hem piece is mounted on the surveyor and the surface is prepared with the cast at the desired path of insertion. The surveyor is used to parallel a keyway part of an internal attachment to the chosen path placement before waxing the rest of the crown around the plastic pattern. If you have one of these on each side of the arch, they must be perfectly parallel to each other in order to have the partial denture seat all the way. What better way to assure perfect parallelism than with the use of the surveyor? The surveyor may be used to create internal rest in cast restorations by attaching a handpiece to the vertical arm of the surveyor to prepare the internal rest in either a wax pattern or in the metal crown after it's been cast. It is a rest that is made with tapered fissure burrs to create almost parallel walls and the apical portion of the seat is usually prepared with a round burr. There can be no undercuts and they must be prepared in line with the path of placement of the partial. The RPD framework pattern is waxed to the rest. The internal rest provides horizontal stabilization because the relatively vertical walls are more parallel than the conventional occlusal rest seat. They should be used with two supported removable partial dentures as they provide more torque on abutment teeth when an extension base exists. A ball and socket, a spoon-shaped occlusal, or a non-interlocking rest should be used with distal extension removable partial denture designs. What do you think about using the internal rest on natural teeth or on the full porcelain crown? Is it appropriate? Yes or no? The answer is no. We do not want to use it. The internal rest is usually deeper than the conventional rest with steep vertical walls. The natural teeth cusp are apt to fracture as well as the unsupported porcelain. Also, being deeper, you would probably be into dentin on the natural teeth and that would be very uncomfortable. It's okay to use the internal rest on that porcelain to metal crown shown in the lower picture as long as it is prepared totally into the metal part of the crown where we don't have that chance of fracturing the porcelain. Restorations can be machined using the surveyor to provide extreme parallelism for the prosthesis and to even include attachments for retention to make it very aesthetic. These examples on the right are machined restorations that have no buckle direct retainers on them and they're very aesthetic. In surveying the diagnostic or master cast, we have satisfied those objectives that we discussed at the beginning of the lecture. We have to find the best path of placement for our removable partial denture. The factors that determine the proper path of placement are, one, the establishment of guiding planes, two, retentive areas, the presence of suitable undercuts, three, interferences that need to be eliminated on the hard tissue or soft tissue, such as undercuts, and four, aesthetics must be created. We talked a little bit about guiding planes. These are proximal surfaces of the teeth that are relatively parallel to each other that must be found or created to act as guides for when the prosthesis is placed and removed from the mouth. Guiding planes ensure a definite path of placement of the prosthesis as the rigid parts, namely the guide plates of the prosthesis, contact parallel surfaces on insertion and removal. They are absolutely necessary to ensure class retention. We determine the relative parallelism of the surfaces of all the abutment teeth by contacting the two surfaces with the analyzing rod. The table has a ball and socket lower portion that allows you to move the cast in various directions. The tilt of the cast is determined in relation to the looking at it from the posterior. If the cast is positioned with the anterior teeth lower than the posterior, it is said to have an anterior tilt. Top picture. If the posterior teeth are lower than the anterior teeth, it's said to have a posterior tilt. 
mental picture. If the cast has the right teeth lower than the left teeth, it is said to have a right tilt, and so on. Extreme tilts should be avoided. Back to our guide planes. I like to start my survey by placing the occlusal plane relatively parallel to the tabletop, but determine the relative parallelism of the proximal surfaces of all the potential abutment teeth by contacting the proximal tooth surfaces with the analyzing rod. This slide shows how you can alter the position of the lower cast on the table anterior posteriorly until you achieve the greatest combined areas of parallel proximal surfaces that may act as guiding planes. You may have to do some alteration of the proximal surfaces to achieve this. The end result of selecting the anterior posterior tilt should be to provide the greatest combined areas of parallel proximal two surfaces that may act as guiding planes. You will move the cast anterior posteriorly until these guide plane surfaces have equal little triangular spaces below where the rod touches the tooth. You must check all the abutment teeth each time you make a position change. You rarely have perfectly parallel flat surfaces on the teeth. You have to prepare them. You will usually be able to prepare no more than two to four millimeters of guide plane on each of these teeth. Other surfaces of abutment teeth can act as guide planes also. Reciprocal or stabilizing components of the clasp assembly contacting in its entirety on the axial surface of an abutment tooth can act as a guide plane. These other surfaces, as shown on the previous slide, are measured by the lateral tilt of the cast to the vertical arm of the surveyor. The second factor that determines path of placement is retention. Retentive areas must exist for a given path of placement and must be contacted by retentive arms that are forced to flex over a convex surface during placement and removal. A tooth that does not have an infrabulge or retentive area is not good retention when the partial is completely seated. By contacting the buccal and lingual surfaces of abutment teeth with the analyzing rod or diagnostic stylus, the amount of retention existing below the height of contour may be determined or estimated. It is that triangular space of light that shows the point height of contour and the infrabulge below it. Retention is best observed as a triangular space of light between the point where the analyzing rod touches the tooth, which is the height of contour, and the apical portion of the tooth surface being studied. There is a rule of balanced retention. If you have buccal retention on one side of the arch, it is necessary to have buccal retention on the opposing side of the arch. The Kennedy class three and four will usually have four clasps. Two of those clasps must be either on the buccal or on the lingual of the tooth to satisfy balanced retention. The other two ideally would be on the same surface of the tooth, but that doesn't always happen. The Kennedy class two will usually have three clasps and two of those must be on the same surface of the tooth, either the buccal surface or the lingual. The Kennedy class one will have two clasps and both must be on the buccal or both must be on the lingual to satisfy balance retention. If you have lingual on one side of the arch, you must have lingual retention on the opposite side of the arch to satisfy balanced retention. If you have buccal on one side, then you must have buccal on the opposite side to satisfy balance retention. It does not have to be the same tooth, though, on the opposite side of the arch. On this arch, we are using the premolar on one side, and the opposite side has the molar for retention on the buccal. If you have a third and a fourth abutment, the retention may be on either the buccal or the lingual surface and does not have to have the same surface as the retentive area. One could be on the buccal and the other could be on the lingual. If you have four abutment teeth, the only situation you cannot have is buccal on the right side of the arch and lingual on the opposite side of the arch. 
This does not satisfy the rule of balanced retention, and that partial denture framework will want to dislodge itself in the direction of the arrow shown on the picture if lateral forces are applied to the framework. To determine the retentive areas, you alter the cast position by tilting it laterally from left to right until similar retentive areas exist on the principal abutment teeth. Try not to alter the anterior posterior tilt that was established to determine guide planes. Sometimes it's necessary and retention takes precedence over the guide plane position. The guide planes may be prepared on the abutment teeth. Extreme tilts should be avoided. An undercut must be present on the tooth, not created by tilting the cast. Look for the presence of small triangular spaces of light on either the buccal or lingual surfaces that designate an undercut on the tooth. Think about satisfying balanced retention when you're looking for undercuts. You can also think about the type of clasp you wish to put on a tooth, but it might be a little bit early in the game if this is the first time you're looking at this lecture. The large upper image shows the correct point of 0.01 undercut on the tooth. It is where the vertical rod of the 0.01 undercut gauge is in contact with the tooth, which happens to be at the height of contour, and the horizontal lip of the undercut gauge is also in contact with the tooth. The common errors that students make when measuring a retention are shown in the large, lower three pictures. In A, the horizontal lip is not touching the tooth even though the vertical aspect is. In B, the vertical rod of the undercut gauge is not touching the tooth even though the horizontal lip is touching the tooth. In C, the lip is touching the tooth, but it isn't even into an undercut. Check the retention by placing an undercut gauge into the mandrel and measure the areas of undercut on the teeth as shown on the previous slide. If this is the final position of your cast, mark the retentive areas of undercut with a red line as shown in the lowest picture. Here's a little summary of retention. Clasp retention is dependent on the existence of a definite path of placement and removal. The most desirable path of insertion or removal will almost always require some kind of tooth modification. Retentive undercuts must be present at the horizontal position. If they are not present, they must be created by means of tooth alteration, crowns, or other restorations. Another factor that determines path of placement is interferences. The process must be designed so that it may be placed and removed without encountering hard, namely tooth and bone, or soft tissue interferences. A path of placement can be chosen if the interferences can be eliminated by surgery, extraction, modification of tooth surfaces during mouth preparation, or placement of crowns and restorations. Mandibular cast interferences. Check the lingual surfaces that will be crossed by the lingual bar or plate major connector. Bony prominences and lingually inclined premolars are the most common interferences on the mandible. Another area of possible interference are the abutment teeth that will support or be crossed by minor connectors or clasp arms. There are rules about where these arms must be placed and to what position they must go. Direct retainers would ideally go into an undercut below the height of contour and in the cervical one-third of the tooth. The first half to two-thirds of the arm must be above the survey line. The tooth surface may be altered at the time of mouth preparation to remove any interference that does not allow for the proper placement of the direct retainers. Non-retentive and stabilizing clasp arms or reciprocal arms are best located between the middle third and the gingival third of the crown rather than the occlusal one-third. 
Guiding plane areas of abutment teeth often need to be recontoured due to high survey lines. An area of two to four millimeters of guiding plane must be prepared above the survey line to allow the guide plate to slide into place on a parallel surface. The survey line often needs to be lowered to accommodate this. Guiding planes can be prepared parallel to one another and parallel to the path of insertion. This facilitates stability in the prosthesis. A final factor that determines our path of placement is aesthetics. Clasp designs that will provide aesthetic qualities must be selected. Sometimes, even though our clasp of choice might be a cast circumferential, we may choose a bar clasp in order to get better aesthetics. When anterior replacements are in the design, the choice of path of placement becomes even more critical and limited. The teeth chosen for direct retainers may not be the most mechanically stable of our choices. For instance, in the example above, we might move back to our second premolar instead of placing a clasp on the first premolar. This would make this final case more aesthetic. The final path placement will be the anterior posterior and lateral position of the cast where the vertical rod of the surveyor satisfies all the factors discussed above, the guiding planes, retention, interferences, and aesthetics. When you have your final path of placement, it's time to tripod the cast using the undercut gauge. Some method of recording the relationship of the vertical arm of the surveyor to the cast must be used. The lab technician will then be able to orient your cast to the same position when he receives it. You will be able to reorient it on your surveyor when you receive the framework back from the laboratory. There are a couple methods of tripoding the cast and we're going to use this one. First, you place a 0.03 undercut gauge into the mandrel. Then, you adjust the vertical arm to where you can touch three widely spaced places on the cast without moving that vertical arm up or down. Next, with the edge of the undercut gauge, score all three of the locations with the edge of the undercut gauge. Again, make sure that you do not move that vertical arm up or down. It needs to stay stationary while you do this. Use a red pencil to mark the grooves that you made in the cast so that you will be able to easily see them. Make the mark about four millimeters in length. Then place a cross hatch or a cross mark in red at each of the locations. And lastly, circle the cross area in blue. Now you'll be able to identify your tripod marks very easily. A second method is also explained for tripoding the cast. A sharp instrument or pencil should be held against the surveyor diagnostic stylus or analyzing rod while scoring or marking the cast. You score two widely spaced marks on two sides and the back of the cast. See the illustration to the right. When surveying the cast, you should survey all posterior teeth and any teeth next to the edentulous area. I like to also include any area that metal is going to cross. You should survey that tooth. Interferences and rest are marked with a red pencil. The metal framework is indicated with a brown pencil, any metal. The acrylic resin and the internal finish lines are marked with a blue pencil. After the master cast has been surveyed and designed, the dentist writes a prescription and sends the case to the laboratory. The first thing the laboratory does is block out and relieve the master cast. In construction of an RPD framework, an undercut free cast has to be created, except for those little areas in the terminal one-third of the direct retainers. 
The laboratory uses the surveyor and the wax trimmer to apply and carve wax to all areas below the survey line except the retentive areas for the direct retainers. Relief wax is also applied to the master cast to create areas of spacing under the framework. An example of the need for this is to create a space for base to flow under the base attachment to lock on the replacement tees. An impression is then made of this blocked out and relieved cast. That cast made from the impression is used on which to fabricate the wax pattern for the RPD framework. The pattern is then cast and the framework is returned to the dentist for try-in. Check your surveyor to see that you have all of the tools that were indicated earlier in this lecture. Please bring your surveyor with tools, your red-blue pencil, brown pencil, lead pencil, extra carbon markers that are usually available on the benches in the labs, a perio probe or a millimeter ruler, a cleoid discoid, and the eraser tool that is provided for you. A cast and a tentative design sheet should be at your desktop when you arrive. For those of you who are not in the class, I have the following suggestions as far as order of things. First, review the Kennedy Class 4 lecture. Then, print the forms that are at the end of the lecture. You can do a screen capture and possibly print those little forms. Then, I want you to do the Kennedy Class 4 maxillary and mandibular survey and design seminars. Each cast has four videos. Video A is a description of the cast in your wish list as far as possible design based on the rules for the Kennedy Class 4, and some other designs might be discussed. Video B is a survey of the cast as the video progresses. Do it with the video. Video C is that you draw the design on the tentative design sheet if you do not have the cast. And even if you do, it gets you used to doing prescriptions for the laboratory and actually drawing designs. Video D, you draw the design on the cast or on the sheet shown at the end of the lectures. The drawing with the class or with the video is very helpful. And again, in learning and identifying the proper placement of parts. I start you off or recommend that you start off with the Kennedy Class 4. You are trying to learn so many new things, and I think the Kennedy Class 4 is probably the simplest of the different classifications to learn. So, after you finish the Kennedy Class 4, then go to the Kennedy Class 3, followed by the Kennedy Class 2, and then the Kennedy Class 1. I think it makes more sense this way.